We are back with the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. We're back with a full house, too, this week. We got DJ Shockley back in the house. Dave Archer and I am Derek Rackley. Before we get started <laughs> on what we've got, I wanted to <laughs> make sure yeah. that we, we threw yeah. it out. We got to yeah. throw it out there that DJ starts a new job this year. He starts covering big events throughout the season. First, we talk about on our podcast that he goes to Houston as uh, the, the correspondent covering the Atlanta Braves. What yeah. happens? The Braves win the World Series. Yeah. Then they send him to Indianapolis. Yeah. And his <laughs> beloved <laughs> alma mater, yeah. the Georgia Bulldogs, come home with a national <laughs> championship. <laughs> so, so first of all, congratulations. Thank you, Rhett. Thank you. Uh, thank as the, you. the thank former you. Georgia Bulldog, thank I know you. you've got a bit. You had to have been flying high the last oh, couple man, days. Oh, it's man. Huh? It's been fun the last few days. I ain't going to lie. Uh, obviously... Having won one 41 years, uh, Dog Nation is beside their self, and I am too, man. It was, it was fun to be there. A lot of uh, excited people, and uh, appreciate you guys. So uh, yeah, um, yeah. let me just throw this one right out, like the, uh, the, the <laughs> elephant in the room here. So the Braves won a World Series. Talk to me. Georgia won the National Championship. Talk and Falcon me. fans are watching. They're saying, where's ours? What's up? Yeah, we on deck, baby. <laughs> well, they say they say good things happen in threes. There we it's go. coming, okay. right? We on deck, there baby. Okay, so we just, just got to wait till the 2022 season. Hawks went to the, what, Eastern Conference Finals? So Things are looking up in the Atlanta area, way, everybody. Um, so anyway, congratulations, Georgia Bulldogs. Let's get into Atlanta Falcons. First of all, here's what we're going to cover. There's a quick reactions. Not necessarily for the game last weekend. We're going to get the guys' quick take on what they felt this season kind of shaped up to be. We're going to talk about the things that we liked and the areas that need to be improved for next year, as we've obviously got a lot of time to talk about how this organization is going to evolve and how this roster is going to end up changing. We'll talk a little bit about free agency and the NFL draft. And then I'm going to have the guys and even myself, we're going to give our favorite Falcons memory from the 2021 season because there was a lot of good memories. Mm -hmm. There was obviously some times, some, some times that people want to forget uh, when you have a 7-10 and 10 season that happens. But we're going to talk about the positives from this one. So, guys, let's go ahead and start us off. Quick reaction today is combine the two, the new general manager and the head coach, DJ, I'm going to start with you. How would you grade or rate their first season in charge of the Atlanta Falcons? You know what? I, I, I'm going to give them a C um, grade because this season was up and down. Um, obviously, I, I think with coming into this organization, we all knew there was going to have to make some big moves. There were going to be some big names that left. There were going to be a lot of changes. And to come into this organization, into year one, and try to establish your particular identity or culture was going to be hard. It was going to be tough. Coming off the season you had, it was going to be tough. But I think this team continued to show signs throughout the year that gives you much – much room for improvement, but also gives you some excitement because of the guys that had helm. And I think, you know, we, we all heard both guys talk, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was it yesterday or so. And you feel good about the progression of where this pro, where this organization is going because of those two guys at the top. And obviously everybody expects things to happen really fast in year one. And it, it, it's tough to do that, but I think this organization is in good hands with both guys that are at the top. All right, so DJ's middle of the road. Arch, what do you got for your grade? I think I'm going to go B-. minus. Uh, I thought that there was a lot of things that this team did that they didn't have from an asset standpoint. We know about Calvin Ridley not being here. That's That's got to be a major thing you count, and it can't count against the coach or the general manager. Correct. You don't foresee that. Correct. How about the addition of some of the bodies you added, Anthony Rush, Mike Pinnell, guys you added in that interior of the defense that I thought made them competitive. The ability to dodge around the injuries. Isaiah Oliver goes down, who, who had rounded himself into a really pretty good nickel. You lose him, and now you're playing two rookies, three rookies sometimes at that position. So I thought Dean He's did a nice job on the staff. I thought Arthur was growing into what he wanted to be as a as play a play caller, caller here, yeah. but also as the overall seer of the team. Yeah. It's his first time to be a head coach. So I thought there was a lot of dancing around there, and I thought that Terry and his staff did a really good job of adding some of those bodies we talked about. So I think if you combine maybe some of the shortcomings and mistakes they made during the games to how to close a game out, all those kind of things, the learning process, and then adding some of the bodies and the development of players in the offseason or, or, or during during the season – in the weeks they didn't play, 
I thought that when you add that together, B minus seven wins, do what you doubled your win total from a year ago. So I think that's a promising sign as you move forward. Yeah, Dave, I'll be quick here. I'm going to piggyback on that one. I think B minus as well. I think the positives that come out of this one is you get some really good performances by guys that were kind of thrust into the spotlight. Russell Gage played really well this year, obviously without having Calvin Ridley, that true number one threat in the National Football League on the outside. We got a chance to see what Kyle Pitts can do. First year in the NFL, four, number four overall pick, he gets selected to go to the Pro Bowl. Uh, I think we also saw how good Foye Aluakan can be in that linebacking crew, the tackling machine, a leader of that group, of the entire defense, and him getting his hands on the football. So I think there's some positives. Obviously, the negatives are, and we'll get into it a little bit more, lines of scrimmage got to be better. I think a running game needs to be more consistent, um, and then – finding whoever it is going to be. Hopefully it ends up being Calvin Ridley, but that number one option in the receiving game, yeah. take pressure off Kyle Pitts, give the defense something that they have to consider, something they have to respect in the passing game and not focus all their attention at the line of scrimmage. So we've kind of got that C, B minus area there for the grade for Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot. So Dave, let me go right back to you. Let's talk about the areas, I mentioned some of the areas that were positive. Expand a little bit more on some of the good things that you saw that the Atlanta Falcons can build on. Doesn't necessarily have to be an individual performance, but it can be. But areas that you feel like this organization can use as a building block for years to come. Yeah, I think there's a couple of linchpin things that to me stick out. Number one, you heard Arthur Smith talk about it throughout the year. This is a 60-minute team. It's not a team that gets down and all of a sudden it's over with. Now, they had a couple games got away from them, but it wasn't because guys weren't competing. Now, if you upgrade some talent in places here and there and you still have that mentality, what does that do? Is it all of a sudden, are you a 10-7 uh, and seven team? Are you an 11-6 and six team? So that can translate to wins, but you have to have that culture. You hear the word culture all the time. Our culture is we're coming to work every day, and then on, sat on Sunday we apply that, and that means we play for 60 minutes. I think that carries over. That's a culturally changed scenario that they made happen, Arthur Smith and his staff. Uh, and I think – when you begin to think about what the defense was or wasn't, there were a lot of shortcomings. You couldn't get off the field on third down. You had a tough time against the run the last couple of weeks. But what you did do is you took the ball away. Yep. They had 12 consecutive games where they took the football away. That's a carryover. That's a mentality on the defensive side of the football. That's a couple of guys, things that jump out to me immediately that are things – Oh, I can. That's something we're. That's who we're going to be as you move forward. Yeah, competing for sixty minutes, taking the football away. Those, all those things translate into victories, no matter who the personnel is. DJ, what are some of the positives you take away from this season? They can build on. I think that culture word is a big one because obviously, when you bring a new staff in here, you want to establish that culture right away. And I think the standard and style of play that this team, you know, starts to show late in the year. It's something huge and something that you can build on going into the offseason, going into the next season. Because, I mean, you look around the league, and we're not going to name certain teams, but you look and you don't know what the standard is or what the culture is. There are a lot of things that's going on within the organization that you say, I can't hang my hat on. I don't want to go to a place like that. When you see Atlanta play, you understand exactly who they are, you know exactly how they're going to play. And I love that part. I love the growth of this team as well. I mean, Arch just talked about some of the things that happened defensively. And you think about where this defense was at the beginning of the season to where it kind of got to towards the end of the season, where you talk about being able to do multiple things on the defensive side of the ball to take the football away. To, to confuse quarterbacks a little bit, some on the defense side of the ball. Now, obviously, there, there's always things you can work on, but when you see – the growth of what DMPs was able to call. And then you look at some of the young talent that started to play this season on the defense side of the ball, there's nothing like the in-game reps that these guys can yep. learn from. A Richie Grant getting a chance to play in meaningful minutes in a ball game will bowl well for you going into next season. We saw Sean Williams come here in the last couple uh, ball games from that safety spot and was, what, second leading tackler last ball game. That's stuff you can build on. Guy was on the practice squad. You, Terry and his crew went and found him. He wasn't playing. Found him off the street and brought him in. Brought him on the practice squad for a couple weeks. And then, you know, obviously got a chance to play. Those are things that you can build on within the organization. You talked about some of those big guys up front. You had to go find those guys. You had to mold them from the practice squad all the way until they got their moment to play. And those are things that uh, I think you absolutely can build on as you get into the offseason and say, all right, up top, they do have an eye for – the style in which of guys that they want on this team. And it's going to take a little bit of time. People want it right away. Of course, they understand that. But it's going to take 
time for you to establish those type of players and how they fit into your system. So I love the growth and, like Arch mentioned, the style in which play that they, these guys play with uh, all year. I, I don't want to digress to our last topic, but DJ, you mentioned Terry, and you guys talked about some of the new faces that, that were thrust into the lineup. And again, without going backwards, I wonder – how much of a challenge it was for Terry Fontenot in his first season as a general manager having to deal with the fluidity of a roster through yeah. this COVID mess, yeah, right? No doubt. But not only that, like how much better does that make him as a personnel evaluator and somebody that has to juggle moving forward? Mm -hmm. Because and I would you could probably say that for all 32 yeah. general managers across the league and all mm -hmm. the guys that work in personnel, how much better they had to become at their job because at any given day, you had to put a guy on the COVID list and bring somebody up from the practice squad and then figure out how you're going to try to compete and win a football game. Had to have been a challenge, but everybody in the NFL is having to work through it. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. All right, so let's switch gears. DJ, I'm going to come right back to you. One or two, I'm putting a limit on this, one or two things that you think have to drastically improve for Atlanta to turn that record around next year and get into the postseason because that's what it's all about. Yeah. You can sit here and talk about culture. You can talk about the good things all you want. At the end of the day, what does Arthur Blank want? His team in the postseason and competing for the championship. So one or two areas where they need to do to get themselves in the postseason next year. I'm going to focus on one key area, and it's something that – Obviously, we've talked about, fans have talked about, we got to have a dominant pass rusher. We have to have somebody who can change the launch point or could change the outcome of a ball game with the way they get to the quarterback. I mean, you look around the league, uh, 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 T.J. Watt, uh, Miles Garrett, Nick Bosa, Robert Quinn, we, we've seen a lot of these guys this season. And we know the impact of what that guy can do for you in a ball game when they know it's third down. You need somebody to put pressure on the quarterback. We just haven't had the, the semblance of a guy who can do that down in and down out. I think that's one of the, the, the staples of a really good defense is that front part of your defense up top being able to get pressure on the quarterback. We got a guy in the middle we know is going to show up every single ball game in Grady Jarrett and push the middle. We need somebody on the outside as well who can put that same fear. And when you have a game plan, say, this dude cannot beat us. And that's the number one thing I think mm -hmm. you're coming to it for a quarterback standpoint. <clears throat> that's what we look at. Yeah. Because we absolutely want to know where is that guy lined up? He's on my backside. Can he's in the front? Where is he lined up? Is he Do I need you know, to redirect my protection? <laughs> no doubt about it. If you True. come up there and say, okay, well, I know they just have a, I'm not going to say a bunch of guys up here, but they don't have that guy. It makes it a little, life a little bit easier. So I think having a pass rusher, a number one, I think is the 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 first step I believe into uh, establishing what we want is a dominant defense. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. One season with Vic Beasley, and then before that, John Abraham, as far as hey. consistent pass rusher. Yeah, and I wouldn't even say Beasley was a consistent pass rusher. He had 15 and a half sacks. Yeah. Six came in two games. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not even sure you got a consistent. That was in the 16th season. Yep. And by the way, you were scoring 35 points a game yeah. in that yeah. season. Yeah. And so he was rushing the passer the, the entire time. game. Yeah. There was no defending the run. Yeah. So probably your purest pass rush you've had is John Abraham. Yeah. And that's been a long time ago. Okay, Dave, your turn now. Um, what is the area or two that you feel like needs to improve the most? Well, shock hit the number one. So I'll jump to maybe 1A, and that would be the offensive line. You've got to find a way to secure the offensive line. And I mean the interior interior offensive line. I think Jake Matthews is still serviceable and is solid at left tackle. McGarry might be a little bit more of a question on the right side. Um, and I'm not trying to name anybody out, but there's, they're certainly going to evaluate. I think you have to be stouter on the interior. That translates to giving Ryan the ability to climb in the pocket, which he was not able to do. When you watch and you go back to just the last game, when he has the ability to climb in the pocket and or set his feet and shuffle forward, he's as good as anybody in the league. We saw throws all over the field, fade routes. We saw corner routes, deep over routes. 
But if he has to retreat, like most quarterbacks, he's going to have a problem completing passes and or getting the ball down the field. So I think offensive line for me is 1A to what Shox's maybe number one was. I don't think there's any question. Lines, lines of the scrimmage on both sides have to improve. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with you guys. To me, that's that's the most glaring issue that has to improve. And and, and I could throw in there, yes, that you've got to have a, a Calvin Ridley, yeah. somebody comparable, somebody mm. on the opposite side, whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day, if the offensive line offensively is not fixed, it doesn't really matter who you have out there. And, and to all the people – and look, and I don't say all the people because, I, you know, I run around in, in, in circles and guys that will be Falcons fans and they'll say, oh, we got to have a new quarterback. Matt Ryan, he just he can't do it anymore. And I, and I have to stop and I'm saying – Matt Ryan is not the problem. And I actually want to pat him on the back. The way that he managed this year, I know he was frustrated. He very rarely ever showed it on his face. And for a guy that knows that he can sit back there and pick a defense apart and not have the chance to do it, I can't imagine how frustrating that is for him. But I thought that he handled it magnificently this year as far as the mental side of it, right? What did he do? Just kept going out there and competing, like you talked about, mm-hmm. for 60 minutes every single time. So we talked about the lines of scrimmage. Defense, pass rush, offense, got to give him time to throw. Um, let's spin it forward now. Let's talk about free agency because there are some guys that had some good seasons this year who has a expiring contract. Mm-hmm. So, Dave, I'm going to come back to you. Two or three guys, and, and you, can dis, you can kind of expand as much as you want, that – you feel like need to be a priority. They need to be in a Falcons uniform next year. Yeah, one number one is Foye Aluokan. You touched on him earlier. Foye Aluokan led the National Football League in tackles, 192 tackles. Banana, I think you've got to go back to 2000 <laughs> when you find a backer that ha- or someone that had that many tackles in one season. Uh, he nudged out the guy that's kind of been the title holder for a long time, Bobby Wagner, who's been a great linebacker for Seattle. So Foye Aluokan led the league in tackles. And it's not just what Foye did – sideline to sideline. Oh, by the way, he had three interceptions and two sacks to sprinkle in there as well. But he is the play caller. He had taken over the headset. He's the guy calling all the plays. And why not? A guy from Yale, you're going to hand him the reins of that. (laughs) But his digestion of what Dean Pease is looking for, his ability to adjust the front, maybe even some of the guys behind him, get guys set up. I think there's a huge value attached to Foye Lukin. Now, I don't know what that price tag is. You just led the league in tackles and get in, and Foye, I hope Foye gets anything he can, everything he can, but let's hope it is in an in Atlanta Falcon uniform. And number two for me, and this might surprise you guys, I'm going Young Way Koo here, number two. Yeah, no, it doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, well, you're a, you're a special teams guy. You know the value of that. How many games do we win <laughs> just simply because of that unit itself yep. in this league? And how many did he win for us this year yep. by coming in and kicking a field goal at the end? So Young Way Koo, who I think is as good as anybody in the league, maybe the best in the league right now, he has got to be a priority to get him signed and bring him back. And I believe he's a restricted free agent, which okay. means they have to put a specified tender on him, mm. which means that let's say they put a first-round tender on him, a team's going to have to give up a first-round pick if they want to sign him. Um, if I feel like you're you're kind of skating on thin ice. You put a second-round tender on him, and then somebody decides, hey, yeah, this yeah. guy's really good. Mm-hmm. We'll give it up to get Young Way Koo. So that might be the decision. I like that pick, though, Dave. All right. Uh, DJ, same question here. You got some other options from free agents. Who do you feel like's got to be back next year? I, I, I mean, I, before I say mine, I, I love the cool call. That is a that is a monster. You know, I, I think guy who was so dependable, consistent for you all year long, and you you just felt good about when Koo came on the field, regardless of how long it was. So I, I love that part of it. Uh, I think the guy who everybody you know when you came into the season, you wasn't sure who he's going to be, what he's going to be. I think CP is that guy who. Obviously, if it wasn't for him, not sure how much offense you will be able to create. And we saw it week in and week out. We saw when he missed, you know, a, a ball game, just how valuable he was to this ball club. And obviously, Cordell Patterson showed the many talents of what he is about and what he can do in this style of system. And give Arthur Smith and give David Groen and them a lot of credit. David Groen was trying to get this kid for a long time on his team. And the fact that they found ways to use him and be creative and, you know, just find ways to, to make him 
a valuable asset to this offense, I think, was, was critical. And obviously, you're going to go into the draft, into the free agency. You're going to find other playmakers around on this offense to help this offense become, you know, what you want it to be. But he is a guy that absolutely is a chess piece, regardless of who you have on the team. Who, If you have a number one receiver, you have a number one back, whatever it is, this guy has shown the ability to be a game changer. Then now you find those other pieces and you move him back to a place where he's really comfortable, more full-time, returning kicks, all that kind of stuff. Even though Avery Williams did a nice job, this is a guy that absolutely adds value to your team and adds it at a lot of different spots on the offensive side of the ball. And he's already he's already uh, spoken out saying that he wants to be in Atlanta. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, carried, now it, carried the sign exactly. off the field. I mean, it's, it's one thing to just say it, but another thing to have a sign no that doubt. says, I want to be back Absolutely. here. So. And, then, and then walk in the locker room with him. So, you know, Coach seen it when he walked in, you know. Oh, Coach, no, nah, somebody just gave it to me. So, yeah, I agree with you guys. Hopefully that price <laughs> well, tag works out for both. Let me ask you guys this then. Okay, how much do you think it helps the Falcons? And this is just us as fans now chopping it up. He wasn't as effective late in the year. The last five games of the season, maybe even the last six games of the season, he averaged about 13, 14 touches a game and only about 50 yards. I think he only scored two touchdowns in the last six games. Now, that didn't bode well for us as a team because you need him to make more plays, but him being 31, 32 years old, out in the marketplace, and this is the only place that's really been able to unlock the cheat codes yeah. on him, yeah. how much does he factor that in? in your mind and how much does the rest of the league look well that's an older player and they kind of did some stuff with him that we don't necessarily think we can do and we didn't see a lot of production late in the year how much is that all you kind of wrap your arms around that as a falcon fan say wait a minute we can keep him here and it yeah. won't cost us over the, yeah, over the time th i mean dave that that's the business side of it i mean i agree with you guys because i feel like he would be a big value to this team but pr maybe not in the amount that he had to do this past season right and that's prob. And I hate to sit here and, and talk about how important it is to have him back and then to say maybe he wore down a little bit because then what's everybody going to say? Yeah. Well, then why do you want him back? Right. Right? Yeah. But maybe if you don't have to use him as one of your top receiving threats, your best rushing threat, you can now sprinkle him in some more, put him in the backfield a couple of times, let him run routes, let him return kicks like he did early on in his career, and then maybe you get more full speed 18 weeks out of him, 17 games, of course. But again, this goes back to the business aspect, DJ. The, the, the price tag on both sides has to work out. No doubt. And that's a big part of it because obviously these are – I mean, you, you mentioned it. The guy's 31, 32. He you know, probably had his best career – uh, you know, stat-wise yep. that he's ever had. And he feels as though he still got a lot more to do. I mean, you think about over the years, he's been the, you know, sprinkle here and there guy. So this was his real, like, full season of mm -hmm. being, like, the guy. Yeah. So in his mind, if he goes to the table, he says, look, I'm 31, 32, but my body still says, hey, I'm 27, I'm yeah. 28, because yeah. I haven't had the usage like I had this year. So uh, there's a, a lot to look at from both sides, but I just know – the value of what we saw this season, and obviously as the, the, the year progressed, like Arch mentioned, it wasn't what it was for a full season. But, I mean, how many guys can do it for a full season like that? So uh, I would love to see, you know, CP back here. No okay, uh, yeah, switching no gears slightly here uh, because once it was determined that the Falcons and all the other teams for that matter not making the postseason, they were able to go ahead and slot where teams are going to be in the draft. So found out the Atlanta Falcons have the eighth pick. I'm not going to sit here and ask you guys who the Falcons need to pick. My question is this for you, Arch. You talked about offensive line, or you could go defensive line. Lines of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. Do you like Atlanta dressing it in the draft? Do you like trying to find somebody that's going to get their first contract that's already established in the NFL to fix some of these needs? I think if you're looking at attacking the defensive line, you're not going to necessarily – I don't know that you're necessarily going to be in a financial situation to get an A-list pass rusher. Someone that's, that's, you know, Khalil Mack, who is potentially yeah. going to be available from Chicago. I think he's due somewhere around $18 million, $20 million in Chicago. He may be a cap casualty for them. And now you've got a guy – he didn't play very much this year. I think he only played seven games for Chicago. Can you get an A-lister like that that's been an A-lister or do you have the fear that maybe it, right. we've we've seen that before? 
I, I tend to think that if you're going to go defensive line, it's in the draft. There's a couple of really good players at the top. This defensive line, it's pretty loaded defensive line-wise, whether it's an interior guy or an edge guy, but we're looking kind of edge guy. There's a couple guys that come to mind. We won't talk about them yet. We'll have That's a, that's a segment for later on, <laughs> but that's where I would go there. Offensive line, I think you could – maybe attack the offensive line in free agency and maybe that B lister yeah. that's a solid player that could come in and play uh, from a free agency standpoint would maybe a plug and play guy there. So that's the way I would attack it. Yeah. I mean, the biggest price tag offensively is generally that left tackle position. And you're right. Maybe that's not the area that, you, but you could potentially steal a guard or a center Absolutely. somewhere in free agency that helps the team. Um, that's that's salary cap friendly, if you will, sure. but improves. And this guy has already proven himself through years in the NFL. Same question, DJ. I mean, does anybody stick out to you that you like? Uh, the reason why I, I, I kind of hate talking about guys right now is it's so early in mm -hmm. the draft process. You could say, oh, my gosh, Kayvon Thibodeau from Oregon. He's going to be the answer. Right. It's like There's a lot of time to go in this draft process. But how do you think Atlanta needs to address it? Uh, I think similar to, to what Arch mentioned. Because up front, to have a guy like – Quentin Nelson just come in and plug and play. You don't see that happen too often, and that's why he's talked about as one of the best uh, to 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 do it when he came out of college. So I, I, I'm along the same lines as Arches. There are plenty of guys that have plenty of experience around the National Football League that can come in here and play the style in which Arthur Smith wants, especially from the interior of the offensive line that can add value to your offensive line right away. And when you go in the draft, yeah, you know, you know, some of those guys have, have played a lot of football uh, in college, but you never know how they're going to fit when they come into your system, into your organization, and try to plug them in right away and say, all right, come be this, this destroyer in the only inside. So I, I love the fact that you have the opportunity in free agency to go out and find these guys that they may fit, that you know that's played in your system already that can come in and add that value right away. So I love the free agency part for the for the, for the offensive line. Yeah, and the hope is that uh, we'll have plenty more of these discussions talking yeah. about personnel as we work our way through the uh, the off season, and hopefully maybe we can kind of narrow things down a little bit. And then obviously once you get into March and April, the organization is going to help make that you? decision. What about for you? Us. <laughs> you huh? Terry Fontenot huh? did say in the postseason presser that their approach to the draft is still best player available. I'm not saying they're going to take another tight end at number yeah, eight yeah. Uh, or a wide receiver, but you'll love the depth on the offensive and defensive lines. I think that's the foremost in his mind. So uh, keep that in mind. Best player available. Uh, that might be interesting at number eight. Now, I've, I've always wanted to be like a bug on the wall in the draft room. And when, when you need help on the lines of scrimmage, I'm always like, well, when the best player available to you, does it end up being a defensive end <laughs> or, or an offensive tackle? I mean, it's best pair, yeah. player available to you. Uh, again, long ways to go down that process. All right, last topic, guys. Um, let's go ahead and wrap this up. I want, Dave, I'll start with you. Favorite moment of this season for the Atlanta Falcons? Could be a play. It could be a sequence of plays, a game. What was your favorite moment this year? I think the thing that stuck out to me is, uh, is I love beating the Saints. I had the ability to beat the Saints a few times when I was playing, and to beat them in their building was a big moment. I thought that it was a game where Atlanta – somewhat controlled the game and then all of a sudden New Orleans stormed back the crowds going bonkers down in the Superdome and Ryan finds Cordero Patterson down the sideline on a huge play that sets up the game winner for Young Way Koo yep. I thought for me there was a there were a number of moments like that we had a, a few plays elsewhere and I'll let you guys jump into some of those but for me I love beating the Saints and nothing feels better than to beat the Saints in their building and uh, that was the moment that kind of stuck out for me when all of a sudden you said well there isn't anybody can play with Patterson. Yeah. They just can't cover yeah. it. It's always a, a good moment. And I know you talked about hopefully trying to spoil it for the Saints this past weekend. Uh, not able to do it. DJ, your turn. I'm going to go with uh, a, a guy who had a, a memorable moment uh, for his career. and Some that, uh, you know, he, I know he won't ever forget it. But how about uh, Michael Walker's pick six versus Cam? Yeah. Sure. I mean, that was a pretty cool moment. And after the game, you hear him talk about how he looked up to Cam and, you know, he just enjoyed playing against him. And then he gets a pick six and goes all the way to the house with it. And, I mean, it was a big moment in the game, too. I mean, he, you know, was, you know, dropping off in coverage and, you know, read it really right. So I, I thought that was a pretty cool moment for a player uh, to have that opportunity to. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we all grow up watching guys, and now you get a chance to play against them. Uh, I remember uh, when I first, you know, got walked into this building, and the first guy I meet when I walk into the building is Michael Vick, and I'm like, "Come on, man! I mean, it's just, <laughs> this is this is the guy." 
and now I get to share a room with. I mean, yeah. those are things that people forget. Like, you know, these guys are human too. They 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 have guys that they look up to. And uh, to have that moment, I thought was pretty cool. And to see him talk about it and gleam about it out of the ball game was pretty cool. Yeah, and the bonus that that week, remember his son was born that son was week. Born, and so no he doubt. took his ball, took the ball home. No Here's doubt. the game ball to his kid. I yeah. mean, his son was born. <laughs> what a phenomenal week for Michael Walker. That's a good one, Shaq. Yeah, very good one. I, you know, I'll finish it off by saying not necessarily a specific play, but I'm going to say it was the hello NFL from Kyle Pitts in back-to-back weeks. Oof. Plays against the Jets has a nine for 119 yard performance and then he backs it up the next week against the Dolphins for seven 163 in that game. <laughs> and it's early in the season. And so often think about the pressure, right? The pressure that gets placed on that kid's shoulder, highest drafted tight end ever comes into this organization. And then he's got to be the savior. And early on, sometimes it takes guys like until the end of the year for like the light bulb bump to come off and like, oh, this is how you play. Oh, this is how I kind of go back to my college days. This is early in the season. And Kyle Pitts, and, and, you know, he's calm, cool, collect, doesn't say a whole lot. He basically just said, hello, NFL. What you got? I'm here. Not to mention the fact that that probably helped him get voted into the Pro Bowl, as everybody around the NFL said, this dude is legit, and they're going to find ways to get the football in his hands. So really looking forward to seeing what his future looks like in the uh, black and red and what he can do um, as his career progresses. Now that's going to go ahead and wrap it up. We enjoyed the heck out of being here with you guys. I enjoyed the heck out of being here with you two. No doubt talking a little Falcons, talking a little NFC South, and, of course, some issues and, and some happenings around the National Football League. Our hope is that we will be back on occasion to talk about the Senior Bowl, to mm-hmm. talk about the draft, the free agency, and how this offseason shapes up uh, for this organization. But, again, that's not really up to us three. We'll leave that up to the powers that be. But hopefully this content was good enough. So and I keep, uh, oh, keep nudging them. Keep nudging them that you want some more. <laughs> Uh, once again, I'm Derek Rackley, joined by Dave Archer and DJ Shockley. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Enjoyed it. Appreciate you, Rack. Appreciate you. I'd ask you what you you're going to do in the offseason, but I think we're almost out of time. So, <laughs> DJ, hopefully your travels are allowed you to stay around with your family a little oh, bit no. more. And well, Dave, Manchester United just called, and they want him to be a part of their project. <laughs> They're going to try to win a championship. Exactly. Exactly. So, DJ will be traveling the world trying to help teams win championships, oh, while me and Arch hopefully end up meeting up on a celebrity <laughs> golf course there somewhere around the Atlanta area. Thanks so much for joining us once again, of course, on AtlantaFalcons.com on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, or however you get you podcasts. We thank you so much for joining us all season long. And like I said, we hope to be back real soon. Thanks so much for joining us right here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T.